During last fall's federal election, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that there would be a cap starting immediately on oil and gas emissions. Well, that's important because oil and gas emissions make up 26% of Canada's national emissions, and they're also very tough emissions to abate, to lower. So how are they going to do this? Uh, it's not immediately apparent because a lot of the uh, emissions come from the oil sands and would require years of engineering and, and construction and so on in order to be able to bring those emissions down. So I want to talk to uh, Chris uh, Severson Baker, who's the regional director for Alberta on the Pembina Institute about a submission to the net zero advisory uh, body uh, about how to go about, or at least the principles behind them, the goals uh, and so on. So welcome to the interview, Chris. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Look, there's, so there's two things we can talk about today. One is, are the, the principles and so on set out in your, uh, in your paper. We'll start with those. And the other is how might, you know, what are some of the ideas for actually implementing the cap? So let's start with first, can you give us an overview of your uh, submission, please? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the government is, you know, wanted to go, I think, to uh, the international body, uh, the COP, and, and with, a, with a plan that addressed the biggest gap that was in, uh, in their plan to that point, which was oil and gas emissions. They needed to be able to, to have credibility on in the international stage, be able to say, you know, we, we have a plan that encompasses all of the, the, the sectors, uh, including the one that has been growing and uh, uh, it really hasn't, we haven't been able to make progress on to date. Um, and, you know, so there is a, now a real sense of urgency to, to figure out what this uh, approach could look like and, and to start to implement it in order to ensure that we actually are able to meet our, our international targets. So we think that, you know, as far as principles are concerned, you, you need to sort of, we need to uh, see emission levels um, start to decline from, from current levels, not, you know, sort of peak and then decline. Um, we think that there's a lot of emission reduction opportunities between now and 2030 uh, in the overall upstream oil and gas sector. If you consider, you know, the natural gas industry, conventional oil, uh, as well as the oil sands, um, and uh, and we think that uh, a, a target that is well aligned with where the overall economy needs to go of 40 to 45 percent by 2030 is actually doable. Um, the, the, ch the challenge will be coming up with the, the actual policy and then the regulations in a time frame that would allow industry to start making the kind of investment decisions that are needed. So the big emission reductions would come from, uh, from, from the lowest cost emission reduction sources, which are continue to be methane emissions from the upstream oil and gas sector. Um, and then there's a number of emission reduction opportunities that could be implemented by 2030 in oil and oil in the oil sands as well. After 2030, uh, we, we anticipate that we will continue to see more investments in decarbonization, but we'll actually start to see the price of, of uh, polluting combined with the decline in demand for the product actually starting to result in a reduction in production. Uh, and that would get you the rest of the way to your emission reductions by 2050. So if there's a pathway to capping emissions in the short term, if I understand this correctly, it's probably to start with methane emissions, which are in many cases, I mean, I've seen studies where it's a broken valve, it's a, you know, a, a, a lid on a, or a door, a vent to something uh, left open on a, on a gas processing plant. Is that the place to, you know, the low hanging fruit where, where uh, government and industry can look first to, uh, to uh, start reducing emissions? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've already been, we've already started there and we've had some, some policy and regulations aimed at reducing emissions from uh, methane emissions. They, the Canadian government announced an increased level of ambition. So going from reducing by 45% up to, you know, at least 75% by, by uh, 2035. And, and essentially, you know, you, you can go well beyond a 75% reduction at a relatively low marginal cost of abatement. Um, so what we would support would be some kind of a, 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 a new policy that over that's laid over top of the existing policy, it doesn't replace it. Uh, so you've got the regulations, the methane regulations doing some of the work, but then you've also got a cap or a rising carbon price uh, doing some of the work. And, you know, some 
some of the, 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 the operations that have a high cost of abatement would be interested in buying credits from companies that can do these cheap and easy methane emission reductions. Um, in addition to doing some of their more like no regrets type carbon uh, uh, abatement uh, investments within their own operations. And you can get, and that's where we think you can get a, a lot of the way, if not all the way to a 40 to 45% reduction uh, by 2030 as a result of doing those things. So if I understand this correctly, we start with uh, methane emissions and the, the oil sands, which are the, the biggest source of, uh, single source of emissions in oil and gas. Then they've said that they have a net zero plan, but it's mostly, I mean, think about 60% is of that is uh, carbon capture and storage, but it requires you know, tens of billions of dollars and years and years and years of construction and so on. Um, the, but what, here's a question uh, that's related, but wasn't addressed, I don't think, in your, in your submission. And that is the government, public money goes into abatement, whether it's methane emissions or, or the oil sands or conventional oil and gas. And then post 2030, we get peak oil demand as the International Energy Agency is forecasting. And then there's, we run the risk of stranded assets post 2030. Right. That, that seems to me to be a, a, a serious risk factor here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's a given that that is going to occur. I think that that's why we would support something like an investment tax credit for carbon capture, utilization and storage, which we've, we've been public about uh, in the past, where you know the government will pay for up to, in our view, 50% of the cost of an investment in a CCUS project, but the, the proponent and their investors have to put up the other 50%. And so they have to be satisfied that they're going to get a, a, an adequate return on their investment. And we think you know, we, because we do see a role for CCUS in oil and gas, but also outside of oil and gas uh, for other sectors or other industries and for just taking carbon directly out of the atmosphere. Um, but we don't think that it has as much application in reducing emissions from the oil sands as the companies that put together the net zero pathway report uh, think. In fact, our view of that report is that overall it is not you know, it's, it's a good signal that they agree with the ultimate goal of net zero by 2050, uh, but it really doesn't hold water. It doesn't actually get you to net zero. There's uh, a lot of uh, overestimation of, of what different kinds of technology can, can achieve. And there's no recognition that at some point, uh, the oil sands, just some, certain streams of oil from the oil sands won't be uh, competitive globally. You know, if there's a declining demand for oil and the, the cost of controlling the emissions associated with that, those types of production are really high, they just simply won't continue to produce that, that resource. And so that's a lot of the way that we're actually gonna achieve net zero by 2050 is some emission reduction, some decline in production. And, and, uh, and we need to be prepared for that. And we need to make sure that we don't design a system that actually tries to avoid that because that will just be very expensive uh, and, and, and not actually result in the outcome that we're trying for. So if I understand you correctly, Chris, the, the justification or, uh, for this tax credit and government paying for 50% of CCUS infrastructure is the fact that they, it will have a long life because there are other industries, could be cement, could be petrochemicals, could be all sorts of industries that also can make use of that, even if we, as we expect, uh, oil and gas production decline, or at least oil production declines uh, eventually uh, after 2030. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like where we would see, you know, the, the, the places where you would see the CCUS investment in oil and gas would actually be at, at upgraders and refineries, right? That's where the, 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 the you know, the, the concentrated streams of CO2 that are being directly vented to the atmosphere are, are, exist. We've already seen applications of CCUS to control those types of emission sources at Shell. Um, relatively easy to capture, um, you know, and those types of facilities are going to be around for the duration of, of the sector. It's, it's more the, the sort of the low, high cost, sort of high carbon, um, at, you know, projects that have a, that are well into their life cycle that are likely to be the first to, to, to stop producing, right? So those investments in CCUS at those, at those upgraders and refineries are likely to, to, you know, you're actually going to get your investment out of them but you're gonna have a really hard time convincing investors to put money towards an in situ operation that maybe only has 12 years left of, of, of life by the time you actually get around to building the, 
the, the CCUS plant. Um, so that's why we think that the, the technology has limits uh, overall. Is it time for Canada and Alberta and the industry and Alberta politicians to begin to have the conversation about what, what production, particularly in New oil sands, is, may have to be phased out, may have to be abandoned because it will never, like some of these projects are still at 200 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per barrel, which is extraordinarily high. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, do we need to have the conversation? Because, you know, there's hints of it every once in a while and the industry pushes back against that, but that seems really to be the reality. Absolutely. I think we have to have that that rational sort of conversation about well, what is what does this actually look like over time? I think that, the, you know, the very models that that government could use that would tell them, you know, at what what do we at what price level do we need to set carbon in order to achieve the, the desired outcome? You could also use that to sort of predict well, which facilities are the most vulnerable to becoming uneconomic. And therefore, you can then design a plan to uh, help those communities and those workers with a transition. So it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any surprises. And in fact, and, and we would argue when you start to get into the nitty gritty about how you would do this, um, we think whatever, you know, every time you allow a transaction for one of these carbon credits, you should take off a chunk of that money and put it towards the transition plan. So there's actually a source of revenue that's being generated as, as these trades happen um, so that you can actually uh, help people to to transition, you can help those communities transition. And we and we think if you have enough time to plan, you can do the, you can take what we've learned from the coal phase out and, and other types of transitions and, and, you know, really focus those resources where they're gonna make the biggest impact, right? The people that, um, you know, we, there's some people that we don't have to worry about because they're gonna retire before that facility goes offline. So we obviously we don't need to focus on them. There's other people who have very directly transferable skills to, to some other sector, but who's left, right? How do we help them? Now, final question, Chris. Uh, one of the comments I've heard that I, that I think is uh, fairly interesting, maybe to a narrow audience, but it certainly interested me. And that is the, we don't have very many institutional frameworks for having the kind of conversations that you were just talking about. And I wondered if that net zero advisory group may be the institutional body in which these kind of difficult conversations can be had. Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. Uh, my, that's my hope as well. I think um, there's no reason why we we we, we can't create more uh, places in which those types of discussions are happening. I think you know one of the the barriers to that kind of discussion from happening is is that Alberta doesn't have a net zero ambition, uh, therefore it hasn't directed all of the, of, the, of the government of Alberta to focus on achieving a net zero plan. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it really leaves, uh, it really makes it very difficult for some of these uh, very necessary conversations to occur where they need to occur. So, Chris, uh, always appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for this. Thank you.